The whole perspective concentrates on the universe of micro, meso, and macro service options for the client. During the assessment in Part 1, the practitioner engages in a fact-finding tour to make sense out of where the client has come from and what the implications are for moving into the future. The concern is to both stabilize the client and to move the client towards development of coping strategies that will assist the client in future periods of stress reduction. The assessment process includes the interview that focuses on listening to the client's story. Various tools may be utilized to develop a picture of the client's current mental status. A trauma history and previous suicide attempts are important elements of the assessment process. If the client has had serious uh, previous ideation and attempts, it is important to figure out what was done at the time that led to the prevention of a suicidal act. Resilience is another area to explore to determine how the client was able to move away from the crisis. Further, a discussion that includes an overview of what means of potential harm are available to the client is important. In addition, the client will also want to discuss current suicidal intent, clarify what it means to the client, and determine how the client might intend to use his or her means of self-harm in the current situation. The micro-response to a crisis often includes various strategies to assist the individual in getting through the crisis and lead to a level of stabilization. Examining the various services or parts to the whole assists in discovering gaps in services in the whole to parts perspective. Our discussion will explore a few more elements of micro and meso approaches to suicidal clients. This table by Hill and colleagues provides best practices guidelines for suicide-related crisis response and aftercare in an emergency acute setting and includes consumer recommendations. Always important to include the of people who would benefit from whatever program one is providing. The consumers offered suggestions that we will see how they mesh then with the professional suggestions which we'll look at second on the left side of the screen. But to start, consumer input included the need for peer support, direct referral for services, communication between acute setting staff and services for ongoing care. It's a very critical piece, this communication between professionals. Consumers also discussed lifestyle skills, domestic violence needs, access to mental health staff after hours. This is something that dialectical behavior therapy offers. There's always a 24-hour ability to contact someone if one is obsessing about self-harm. Consumers also emphasize the importance of empathy and compassion among healthcare providers. Additionally, there were concerns about stigma attached to diagnostic labels, non-clinical factors that included positive lifestyles, parenting skills, harm minimization plans, domestic support, and peer support. Then moving over to the professional staff suggestions, professional staff observed that provisions of video teleconferencing could fill gaps in services. Contact with family for professionals developing treatment plans was also seen as an important factor. Assessment of lethality of suicidal attempts and awareness of criminal justice or youth justice system involvement. Contacting clients' family, friends, caregivers to explore psychosocial assessment questions and moreover assessment of broader psychosocial factors. Professionals were also concerned about an increase in sympathy, listening to patients, and responding to patients in a non-judgmental way. Protective factors can be effective buffers to reduce the client's crisis. While there are many protective factors, this is a good starting list to consider when assessing a planning intervention. Most of these factors have positive focuses that move from the present into the future. By developing a vision of the future, it is helpful to include these important support elements effective mental health care, connectedness to individuals, families, communities, and social institutions, problem-solving skills, contact with caregivers, religious and spiritual faith, coping skills, life satisfaction, a sense of responsibility to family, reality testing ability, and strong therapeutic relationships. Moving to concerns of rural residents, 
Urban, suburban, and rural areas each have their own concerns and ranges of resources. As a child, I grew up in a farming community in California and subsequently lived in Idaho, Washington, Arkansas, and Wisconsin, where there are large rural areas, many of which have limited resources and long distances between services. Rural areas provide a challenge for practitioners because of these distances. Communicating with clients via the Internet may provide growing opportunities to stay connected with clients. However, many rural areas do not have access to the Internet or do not have smartphones or computers with which to access the Internet. Also, the current expansion of using smartphones and apps provides alternatives to meeting face-to-face -face with clients that provide a homework dimension for clients to practice skills between sessions with the therapist. The Integrated Motivational Volitional IMV Model of Suicidal Behavior. This is uh, O'Connor and Curtley's work that extends over several years with a couple iterations. This was their first approach, and then we'll see a follow-up that included a more broad kind of look in terms of the questions one might focus with as they met with clients. The first slide here then provides a display of a systems theory-like plan. It can be summarized in three parts. So we'll notice there's the pre-motivational, motivational, and volitional phases as he lists them, or if you're a systems person, the uh, input, throughput, and output. Basically, in the pre-motivational phase, looking first at what we might call the antecedents, the context in which suicide may occur, or diastasis, which is defined as a psychological theory that explains the disorder or its trajectory, and resulting from an interaction between predispositional vulnerability and a stress-caused life experience. So here we're concerned with also the environment and life events which may prompt the person to become depressed, stressed, or feel hopeless. Moving then into the motivational stage, which may be called throughput in the systems theoretical approach. The development of suicidal thoughts labeled in this motivational stage may include how and why suicidal thinking and intentionality emerges. This is also the locus of a sense of being betwixt and between living and dying. Intention is determined by feelings of entrapment, where suicidal behavior is seen as a solution to life circumstances, resulting from chronic or acute stress. So we see here the sense of defeat and humiliation leading to a feeling of entrapment and then suicidal ideation emerging from that sense of entrapment and feeling of not being able to escape. So they're here moving back between the entrapment and defeat and humiliation. There's threats to the self and social problems, solving, coping, memory, and other skills that perhaps enhance or act as buffers to block the movement to the sense of entrapment. But once sense of entrapment happens, the motivational motivators, as we look below, thwarted, belongingness, burdensomeness, all kinds of negative feelings about how one fits in the world. And then, of course, the suicidal ideation, in terms of the throughput, leads to potential outcome behavior that can be self-harming. Volitional moderators, again, are a source of access to means. One has to really examine if the person has access to means and what those are. Uh, exposure to suicide, impulsivity, physical pain, sensitivity, fearlessness of death, imagery, and past behavior. These are all contributing factors that lead to the ultimate attempt that one might experience. So this is the first kind of conceptualization of their theory. This revision happened in, I believe it was around 2015. Here is a more detailed outline of the IMV model. There are a number of questions that will help provide a clearer picture, and this is the iteration of the first attempt at developing the model. So number one, access to means. Does a client have access to likely means of suicide? Second, planning. If then sort of planning. Has the individual formulated a plan for suicide? Three, exposure to suicide or suicidal behavior. Has a family member friend engaged in suicidal behavior? Also here we want to look generationally back, two or three generations, to see if there's a history of suicide within the family. It's a very important information to access. Next, impulsivity. Does the individual tend to act impulsively on the spur of the moment? It's very important in your assessment to determine any kind of brain functioning, such as traumatic brain injury, which may affect the frontal lobe in terms of one's 
impulsivity, anger, impulse kinds of issues. Then physical pain or sensitivity endurance. Has the individual high increased physical pain endurance? This is also a contributing factor to suicidal behavior in terms of feeling entrapped with a pain that can never seem to be relieved. Then fearfulness about death. Is the individual fearful about death? Has this changed in terms of their outlook? Mental imagery. Does the individual describe visualizing dying or after death experiences? And last, past suicidal behavior. Does the individual have a history of suicide attempts or self-harm? Next are the key premises of the IMV model of suicidal behavior. This provides reinforcement again on this level of assessment, which is quite important. These are critical questions. Number one, vulnerability factors combined with stressful life events, including early life adversity, provide the background for development of suicidal ideation. Two, the presence of pre-motivational vulnerability factors, such as socially prescribed perfectionism, increase the sensitivity to signals of defeat. Three, defeat and humiliation and entrapment are the key drivers for the emergence of suicidal ideation. Four, entrapment is the bridge between defeat and suicidal ideation. These three and four are very critical, you know, particularly now in the COVID-19 epidemic. There's a tick in suicide uh, ideation and intent, but one can understand if a person has been unemployed, loses unemployment, is evicted, the sense of defeat and humiliation is a increased risk. And then, of course, that sense of feeling entrapped really sets in and is very detrimental. This, these are issues we have to really be sensitive to at this point in time and certainly in others as well. Five, volitional phase factors governing the transition from ideation intent to suicidal behavior. Six, individuals with a suicide attempt or self-harm history will exhibit higher levels of motivational and volitional phase variables than those without a history. So the history is a very important factor as well. And then seven, distress is higher in those who engage in repeated suicidal behavior over time, and intention is translated into behavior with increasing rapidity. The self-care plan is a synthesis of several app and paper safety plans. Important items that were not included in safety plans examined by Jacinto and Bucky were health, mental health, allergies, medications, vitamins, or supplements. You'll notice that we've added those to the bottom of the form. If one is in crisis and unconscious when discovered, this information may be critical to the way a person might be treated. In this period, COVID-19 crisis has implications for all of us, and this type of information could be a benefit to many whether they are in a suicidal crisis or not. When confronted with various crises in our lives, Having an emergency checklist on hand could be life-saving. When confronted or unable to talk, who are the people one would want called? What are one's health or mental health diagnoses? A list of allergies would be helpful. What medications, vitamins, or supplements does the person use? Who are the health and mental health care providers? The best repository for this information would be smartphone apps with a security code. It is not likely most people would carry an 8.5 by 11 page with them. We will now move to the whole to parts perspective as we weave micro, meso, and macro elements into the approach to the City of Midway allegory. In the simulation discussion, we will examine issues from the parts to the whole and the whole to the parts. Care Framework this framework is a macro process map. Notice it has nine stops along the map in an S pattern, moving down this way, then up the middle, and down the far end. The stops are developing the base where one is going to operate from and engage with the residents in that area, engaging residents to develop the plan, and assess the assets, strengths, and needs of the community organizing residents around various needs in terms of their involvement in the process, priority ranking needs, and then planning specific interventions that will be implemented in the next phase, implementing the plan, then evaluating outcomes as an ongoing process, but at the end of the year there's a significant overall evaluation that leads to a discussion of reassessment in terms of where to go in the next year, improving 
would exist and then implementing what was on the priority list that had not been gotten to this year. This is the locus of the sustainability of this model because upon reassessment one goes around and begins to re-engage residents into the next phase of the program. And we will explore the fusion of treatment, administration, and community models next. The care model process is the foundation upon which community transformation and co-building will take place. As we look at this uh, model here, we were fusing the practice model or the micro model of individual treatment with an administrative model from the Joint Commission that we had discussed earlier. The zero suicide model works within the framework here to develop the specific plans for individuals. In this practice model, dialectical behavior therapy will be a focus of the treatment. That becomes part of the planning and intervention of the program and then what will be implemented in terms of individuals, following then through the process of evaluating, reassessing, and re-engagement as the year goes on. But there are seven components of the zero suicide model. Training, identifying, engaging, and treating all become part of the implementation of programming. Leading a commitment to system-wide cultural change, that's earlier in this process that culminates at the plan. And then transition and uh, policies all evolve as time goes on, mostly initially at the implementation phase where everything comes together and then evaluating, reassessing, and then developing the iteration for the following year. So that's the practice model. The administrative model looks at the tools to assess the effect of change. So here you would have various record-keeping kinds of protocols and evaluative protocols, and then the the movement through the reassessment and evaluation. Basically, the key ideas here would be follow-up services, how well are those provided and how effective are they, cyclical model of program evaluation, again, the sustainability kind of mode that we were looking at, going through the nine and then back around, engagement of the community, which is the critical part of the success here, and then focusing on the person and environment grounding upon which to develop programming within the community, best practice methods and protocols. In this case, DBT is the preferred model that will be implemented in Midway, and sustainable ongoing process. So these are the practice and administrative approaches that fit within the process model framework. We will now consider the Lifespan Australian model. Here we look at the fusion again between Lifespan and the CARE framework, the foundational sustainable map and the community-focused model interacting. In a moment, we'll go into more detail about each of the nine components, but here I just want to list them briefly to give a sense of how this flows into the framework. Obviously, everything will go into an implementation and evaluation phase at some point. So the first thing that is listed is improving emergency and follow-up care, including emergency departments and the weakest link in a lot of programs in the past have been the follow-up care program. Second, use of evidence-based treatment. In this case, DBT will be the micro method or the individual therapy approach, which also has a meso element where there are groups that meet as part of the psychoeducational element of the program. Then identify and support people within the community, training frontline workers, promote self-help, mental health, resilience in terms of being able to seek help and understanding one is having issues. Six, community awareness. The bus driver who kicked Kevin Hines off the bus might have thought twice if he saw this man crying to the degree that he was when he was ejected from the bus because the driver was in a hurry. Seven, provide community with opportunities to manage the change. Eight, advocate for responsible media coverage. This will happen in the second year in terms of the project in Midway. Improving safety and limit access to means. The means to commit suicide is usually a preferred means that one has available. If that means is removed, it's more difficult for the person to elect a equally lethal means, and in many cases, it averts the suicide attempt itself. Next, we will look at each of these nine components in a little more detail. To include community stakeholders, for example, individuals, groups, families, organizations, and communities. This evidence-based approach combines nine components 
incorporating health, education, frontline workers, business, and residents of the community. Communities are assisted in developing new and exciting interventions and programs to support people facing suicide crisis. It is estimated that a program like Lifespan may prevent up to 21% of suicide deaths and 30% of suicide attempts. Now we will look individually at the nine components. One, improve emergency and follow-up care for suicide crisis. Coordinated emergency and follow-up care for individuals in a crisis are important. Communities need to develop and coordinate new and existing interventions to assist people facing a suicide crisis. Again, estimates suggest that a program like Lifespan can prevent up to 21% of suicide deaths and 30% of suicide attempts. The second component using evidence-based treatment for suicidality. People experiencing mental illness are 30 times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. Evidence-based treatments by mental health professionals who use best treatment options and skills have demonstrated effective outcomes. Several psychosocial therapies have been effective in preventing suicide behavior. E-mental health, internet tools, and smartphone apps have been helpful in managing depression and anxiety. Both reduce increased risk of suicide. Internet therapy for depression is reported to be as effective as face-to-face -face therapy for reducing suicide ideation. Clinical services and psychoeducation providers have been shown to improve patient mental health outcomes. The third component equipping care to identify and support people in distress. Many experiencing suicidal thoughts or behaviors visit their primary care physician in the weeks or days before suicide. Suicide studies over 40 years suggest further education about depression and suicidality may be one of the most important effective interventions for lowering suicidal ideation, self-harm, and death. The aim for primary care physicians is to increase skills and resources to identify and care for patients who are at risk for suicide. A recent study of suicide prevention in Australia showed the largest predictive reductions in suicide are associated with primary care physician capacity building. The fourth component, improving the competency and confidence of frontline workers to deal with suicidal crisis. Frontline workers include paramedics, emergency department staff, community-based clinicians. Non-clinical frontline workers include police, firefighters, and emergency services personnel. Suicide prevention training includes the ability to identify, assess, and prevent suicide behavior, safety and collaborative treatment planning, and management and health and safety professionals that will reduce suicide attempts. The fifth component, promoting help-seeking mental health and resilience in schools. School-aged young people need more supports in schools, community organizations, and faith-based groups that work with young people. Peer support programs have shown promise and safety zones where those thinking of self-harm can go for help. Smartphone apps may also be beneficial. Schools can provide an innovative way of reaching young people to prevent suicide and suicide attempts through the delivery of structured evidence-based programs. The next component, number six, training the community to recognize and respond to suicidality. Gatekeepers encounter people at risk for suicide and are in the best place to recognize and respond to symptoms. Skills include identifying, recognizing, and responding to those at risk and helping them. Gatekeepers are important buffers to self-harm and death by suicide. The seventh component, engaging the community and providing opportunities to be part of the change. Community awareness campaigns focusing on prevention of suicide by improving public understanding, improve an understanding of suicide and the conditions that lead up to a suicidal attempt, as well as mental health problems, decreasing the stigma of suicide and increasing self help behaviors. Knowledge and attitudes towards suicide have not influenced suicide deaths or attempts. However, active engagement of the community regarding awareness of signs of suicide may be an important factor in reducing suicidal behavior. And again, we saw in perhaps the bus driver and other personnel that worked 
on or around the bridge, his attempt may have been averted as an example. The next component, number eight, is encouraging safe and purposeful media reporting. Such campaigns encourage safe and purposeful reporting and often include the use of mass media to promote key messages such as television, radio, advertisements, distribution of flyers, and newspaper articles. Media representation of suicide can lead to a copycat effect where media exposure to stories of suicide can lead to suicidal behavior. Prevention can be addressed by media guidelines that do not glorify, sensationalize, or normalize suicide, provide information on health care resources, avoid details about the methods and using stigmatizing language, for instance, he or she committed suicide, and spreading myths about suicide. Preventing those would be more helpful in terms of the community's approach to the media. And the last of the components, and one that is quite important, is improving safety and reducing access to means of suicide. Restricting access to the means of suicide is an effective prevention strategy. Significant declines in general suicide rates have been reported after restricting access to firearms, toxic gas, pesticides, erecting safety barriers, and introducing safe rooms which eliminates suspension points for hanging in prisons and hospitals. Means restriction appears to work because when individuals are prevented from using a preferred method of suicide, some will defer their attempt or use a less lethal means. This has been an overview of a successful program in Australia. The integration of a holistic approach within a community has implications to reduce suicide. In cities and rural communities, there are existing services that might benefit from coordination and eliciting input from citizens about the needs they experience in order to reduce suicide and suicide attempts may further reveal gaps in services. We invite you to join the effort to address this serious issue.